Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight for our webcast about the Wolverines of Oregon. And it will become clear why in all the promotional material for the event, I put the S in parentheses. So I do think our presenters will probably cover that one way or another. Um, but thanks again for joining us. We're excited to have you. And before we do turn it over to the main presenters for the evening, Kayla Dreher and Scott Shively, field biologists for the Wallawa Wolverine Project. I'm just gonna give a couple remarks and do a bit of typical webcast housekeeping. So um, for those who don't know, my name's Danielle Moser. I'm the wildlife program coordinator for Oregon Wild. And Oregon Wild is a statewide conservation organization dedicated to protecting and restoring the state's wildlands, wildlife, and waters as an enduring legacy for future generations. Um, within the wildlife program, which is what I work on, um, we do a number of things, but just to give you kind of the high level overview, um, we're mostly focused on advocating for the return and the recovery of keystone native species, imperiled species, such as sea otters, wolves, wolverine, California condor, marble merlet, really the list goes on, but that just gives you a quick snapshot. Um, we also work to make sure that the folks we have, the decision makers we have, um, like the Fish and Wildlife Commission, like the Oregon Legislature, like the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, that those folks respect best available science, incorporate it into their decision making and reflect the values of Oregonians. So that's kind of the quick overview of our wildlife program and what we're focused on. If you want to learn more about it, please do check out our website, OregonWild.org, um, and to learn more about wildlife and about our programs overall. So now to the housekeeping. Um, if suddenly your screen freezes, just try closing completely out of the program and then rejoining us using the event link that was emailed to you about an hour ago. If you're on your mobile, you should be able to control which view you're seeing and how big it is by tapping on your screen. Um, if you have any questions for the presenters, we will do a Q&A session at probably the last 15 to 20 minutes of the event. So um, do send them our way and we'll be sure to ask those. Um, a video of this webcast will be emailed out tomorrow and posted on our website, OregonWild.org, in the Wild blog section. Um, and if you got a raffle ticket for tonight, um, thank you so much because your support is what allows us to keep doing these presentations. So thank you and keep an eye out for your email as winners will be contacted um, via email tomorrow. So before I pass it over to Scott and Kayla, um, I wanna take a moment to acknowledge and pay respect to the indigenous people who have stewarded this land, otherwise known as Oregon, throughout the generations. Um, for me specifically tonight, I'm calling in from Portland, which is the traditional lands of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, Kalapuya, Wasco, Molala, Cowlitz, and Watlala bands of the Chinook, and many other tribes who made their homes near the confluence of the Columbia and the Willamette Rivers. So thank you again for being with us tonight. Um, I'm looking forward to this presentation from Kayla and Scott. And so now I'll turn it over to them. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Danielle. And thanks to, uh, oops. <laughs> oops, sorry guys. <laughs> Oh, go ahead, well, yeah, man, thank you for everyone who tuned in. Um, looks like we're up to 270 people. Holy cow. Um, yeah, we're excited to be here and uh, to share uh, some information about Wolverines with you and tell you about our project. Yeah, um, we're again so excited that so many people tuned in and hope you take away uh, some of the things that we talked about tonight. Um, yeah, so Scott and I started working with Wolverines projects in the Cascades, uh, in Washington Cascades, and since then our work lives have been very much dedicated to uh, learning more about Wolverines and finding ways to promote Wolverine conservation. Um, and so last year we partnered with the Oregon Wildlife Foundation to conduct Wolverine surveys in Northeast Georgia. Um, Oregon Wildlife Foundation has been a, really a driving force for Wolverine research in Oregon. Um, they supported surveys in the Wallawas um, 
eight years ago and conducted a large survey for wolf reefs and other carnivores in the Cascade several years ago. Um, so tonight we're going to touch on the conservation needs of wolf reefs in the lower 48 states, um, give a, some background and status about wolf reefs in Oregon, and describe the work we've been doing in the Laos. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> new program that we're not super familiar with. There we go. So we, we also wanted to start with the land acknowledgement um, to recognize the Nez Perce people and the enduring relationship that they have with the Willow Mountains, um, which is where we conduct our work. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about Nez Perce history and culture in Northeast Oregon, I encourage you to check out a fantastic reading list. Um, from the Nez Pierce Willowa Homeland website. Um, and that's linked at the bottom of the slide. Another cool thing is that the Nez Pierce word for Wolverine is carrier of snowshoes. I think that's really fitting. Um, we also like to acknowledge our project partners, uh, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and the Willowa Whitman National Forest over there in Northeast Oregon. Uh, they both provide a ton of field support, loan cameras and equipment and ODFW provides snowmobiles for us to use to check our cameras in the winter and uh, stock packing support in the fall to get all of our gear uh, out and set in the field. Hey Kayla and Scott, it's Danielle. It seems like your audio, I don't know if you all backed up a little bit on accident. I, if, if you could try to get a little closer, your audio all of a sudden just started like going in and out. So thank you. Okay. Shoot. Okay. <laughs> Can you hear us all right now? Yeah, that's much better. Thank you. If you could be awkwardly <laughs> close to your computer. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, so yeah, just a little background on wolverines um, for those who aren't very familiar. Um, wolverines are carnivore in the Mustelidae family. So that's the weasel family. Um, and that's the same family that other species like otter and marten and skunks are part of. Um, wolverines are found at northern latitudes around the world. Um, but in the lower 48, Wolverine habitat is largely found on public lands and protected, protected wilderness areas in the Rockies and Washington Cascades. Um, the lower 48 is the most southern part of um, the Wolverine's distribution. Um, so Wolverines, they only weigh between uh, 20 to 40 pounds and they're not typically a species that causes conflict with humans in North America. Um, they don't really predate on livestock here. Uh, they're primarily scavengers of ungulate carcasses like elk or mountain goat, and they hunt uh, small mammals. Um, wolverines defend very large ter territories relative to their body sizes, and um, they're characteristically always on the move. Um, they're very elusive, and they're known for making uh, huge dispersal movements. Um, wolverines are very rare, and they'll have uh, they naturally have um, low population densities. So. Uh, because of their remote habitat and their low numbers, there are aspects of wolverine ecology that aren't very well understood. Um, and also because they're so rare and they inhabit these striking landscapes, um, there's a big sense of mystery and excitement about wolverines. <laughs> so wolverines have a very close connection with snow. They're a snow adapted species. Um, they have large snowshoe like feet and frost resistant coats. Um, and the snowy habitats that they live in are relatively unproductive when it comes to food resources. Um, those, those would be like ungulate, like deer or elk carcasses on the landscape. And so food caching plays a huge role in wolverine ecology. Uh, wolverines cache food in cold places year round to store it for later um, and it prevents the spoilage of meat. Um, and so snow plays a large role in wolverine reproduction. Um, wolverines give birth in February or March and um, they den under deep snow. And so while the kits are in the den, this snow provides insulation and protection to them. Um, and so snow also provides a buffer that limits the presence of other carnivores that would compete with them um, for the limited food resources at these um, high elevations. So um, here's an example to emphasize the importance of snow to female wolverines. Um, this is a, 
a Wolverine natal den entrance in the Washington Cascades during the month of May. And so at this point, there's probably still like eight to 10 feet of snow on the ground surrounding um, this boulder feature. Uh, and so uh, that this Wolverine was dead. And so within a kilometer of this den, we found a network of um, snow crashes that this female um, or her mate who was also visiting the den site had made. And so having these food reserves stored and protected in snow in the springtime is extremely important for um, the high nutritional demands that uh, of females with nursing kits. And so you can, you can see why spring snow is understood to be a limiting factor in where breeding populations of wolverines can exist. So um, a close relationship with snow means that climate warming um, is a threat to wolverines. So um, historically, wolverines were almost completely removed from the lower 48 states uh, during the 1900s due to fur trapping, predator poisoning, and livestock, over, livestock overgrazing in the Western mountains. And so that declined a lot of um, their, uh, caused the population declines to some of their prey species. And so wolverines have been slowly recolonizing portions of their historic range. Um, and so because wolverines are so specialized to mountain ecosystems, they are vulnerable to alterations in these habitat types um, that may occur because of climate warming. And so that would be um, changing vegetation that affects small mammal populations, the loss of that buffer that um, keeps out other low elevation carnivores like coyotes, um, and a potential concentration of winter recreation um, if the lowland snow is de decreasing. And so that would be like backcountry skiing and snowmobiling. Um, occurring more frequently in sensitive denning habitat. So um, this is a snow model predicting suitable wolverine habitat um, that has been pretty influential in wolverine research in the lower 48 in recent years. And so it basically describes the what the available habitat for wolverines is based on the presence of persistent spring snowpack, um, which uh, was is linked to wolverine reproduction. And so um, you can see how naturally fragmented uh, wolverine habitat is and where those long distance dispersals um, become important, uh, an important as aspect of um, life history uh, for um, wolverine recovery in some of these more isolated uh, habitat blocks. Um, and so nearly 10 years ago, uh, the wolverine was petitioned for listing under the uh, Federal Endangered Species Act. And so the basis for that um, was that important habitat will be uh, substantially reduced because of climate warming. Um, and so in this past October, uh, the proposal to list wolverines as threatened was formally withdrawn. Um, and so there's been some disagreement with that decision um, in the scientific community. Um, and so here you can see uh, the Eagle Cap Wilderness, which is in the Wallow Mountains, which is um, our study area. And then the nearest breeding populations to um, of wolverines to, to our study area are in the Payette National Forest in Idaho, which is less than 100 miles away. So um, for wolverines who have um, like home ranges of hundreds of square miles, that's really an easy dispersal distance um, from the, for them. And then there's also uh, Mount Rainier is around 250 miles away. And so, but there's a lot of um, area between that, like low uh, elevation sagebrush, um, more desert, desert um, not very good dispersal habitat between there. And so um, it's estimated that wolverines were removed from Oregon by the 1930s. And so, um, but there was a 40 year period where there were a handful of wolverines that turned up in the state. And so um, these animals were assumed to be uh, extreme dispersal events. So just in individuals that are making um, very long distance uh, dispersal exploratory movements. Um, and so, these are assumed to not represent um, wolverines rec recolonizing organ. Um, 
And so wolverines are known for really long dispersals from the areas that they were born in. Uh, so they can really turn up anywhere while they're making these exploratory movements to find a suitable territory. So that's that's exciting that you can um, come across the wolverine um, in not in habitat that's not very predictive of wolverines, but it doesn't mean that that animal is local to that area. And it's also very rare. Um, so in 2011, uh, multiple wolverines were discovered in the Wallau Mountains um, in Northeast Oregon. And um, this suggested that there were, uh, was a small population inhabiting the Northeast corner of the state. Um, oh yeah, and so another claim to fame that uh, for wolverines and other weasels in Eastern Oregon is the oldest known weasel ancestor um, was found uh, in North America was found in John Day fossil beds um, in Eastern Oregon. Uh, a tiny uh, partial skull from the Oligocene epoch, epic um, millions of years ago. So um, in 2011, longtime wolverine researcher Audrey McGowan um, became interested in conducting surveys in the wolverine er, in the Wallau Mountains. Um, the Wallows appeared to have a uh, suitable wolverine habitat, and it was within reasonable dispersal distance from um, nearby breeding populations in Idaho. So she and her husband, Pat, um, who's also a biologist and a pilot, conducted systematic surveys for wolverines using remote cameras and aerial flights to search for tracks. Um, and so in the right snow conditions, wolverines will leave a very distinct track pattern um, that's recognizable from a plane. Um, this photo on the right, uh, taken by an ODFW biologist a couple years ago, uh, has a lot of cool things going on in it. Um, so the most, tr uh, most common trackaway pattern for the wolverine is uh, this angled three print lope where the back foot overlaps on the middle print. And so you can see it more closely in the, the photo to the left of the big one. Um, and then there's also this two by two bounding lope towards the bottom, um, which is more common in deeper snow or when the animal, animal's moving quickly. Um, and then I, at the top, you can see that those three print tracks switch up to um, where the other uh, foot is leading the track. Um, where it's angled in the opposite direction. Um, and then there's also some Martin tracks at the bottom making some big bounds across the frozen lake. Which are cool to see. All right. So the, uh, the camera monitoring station that Dr. McGowan used for her study in the Wallawa and actually designed in years previous is known as a run pole. And its purpose is to capture diagnostic photos and gather genetic information on individual wolverines, all uh, non-invasively, meaning you don't have to trap or handle the animal at all. Uh, so using this, you can identify individual wolverines by their unique markings, collect hair samples for D DNA genotyping, and determine the sex of individuals, and if you're lucky, even reproductive status uh, for females in the springtime if you get evidence of lactation. So the diagram here, how it works is the, the wolverine will climb up this tree and out onto the horizontal run pole, and it has to square up and face the camera to get at the bait, which is cabled between two trees hanging in midair, and so it puts its front paws up on that support structure, squares up to the camera, looks up at the bait, and you get uh, really good photos, ideally, of their of their chest and neck uh, goler markings. and. Uh, as they're tugging on the bait, pulling on the bait, they're backing into a series of uh, alligator clips as a hair snag device. And so you're grabbing hair samples from them, hopefully, and then those uh, dangle in view of the camera and you can actually uh, match um, the hair samples, the, the DNA from those to certain individuals using their markings. And so here's just an example of, of uh, wolverine markings. These are 10 captive wolverines that Audrey uh, practiced this method on in Washington. And you can see all those markings are different. They, they look very similar, but if you get these good diagnostic photos, um, you can tell them all apart. And then uh, the, the photos on the right here um, are uh, determining sex and, uh, and reproduction. You can see 
the female in the photos, uh, the females in the, the bottom photos there are lactating. So here's kind of an up close view of uh, the hair snag device here. And this, all the, this black plastic here is it's called ultra high molecular weight plastic and it's super strong stuff it can stand up to bears up there climbing around jumping around it, it'll bend over almost almost horizontal and pop right back up um, so it's pretty bomb proof stuff and so you've got your alligator clips uh, kind of drilled and glued into those and they're all hanging on little lanyards and so when they're sprung they they've got hair on them and they're hanging there and no other wolverines uh, are gonna are gonna put hair in those clips so you can you can see in the photos you know wolverine a triggered clip you know left left top or whatever and uh and you can match um that dna to those individuals and we'll kind of show you a video here um of one of these in action this is a video of stormy uh nickname wolverine back in 2012 uh on audrey's study <coughs> I think we were muted for a second. I don't know if you heard us, but this is uh, Stormy uh, from 2012. Uh, a video of him playing around on a run pool here. And for bait, these things usually uh, roadkill, kind of whatever you can get, uh, deer and elk. We use uh, a lot of elk heads are nice um, because it's, you know, mar pine martens and birds, they'll get most of this meat before a wolverine will even find it. You know, it could take them months. And so as long as there's a, a bone hanging up there, some sort of visual cue, um, wolverines will still come, you know, months later and, uh, and climb up, check it out and get their, their photos taken. It's kind of lucky to capture a runner in the background there. Oops. Okay, so the, this is back to Audrey's findings here. So in her first year, she detected three different individual wolverines. And uh, two were conclusively identified as male. Stormy was an adult male at the time, meaning he was at least two years old. And uh, this wolverine on the right, Zed, uh, was, was probably less than two years, young male. And then a third, a third individual, Iceman, he never, never stood up on a rum pole to get those good photos. It could, could be a young male based on the photos that she did get, um, but inconclusive, it could, it's possibly could, could have been a female Wolverine. Um, you can see he's got white toes in that photo there as it's another diagnostic marking that Wolverines get sometimes. Um, they can have white toes or feet or even a whole white arm or shoulder. Yeah, so these three all likely males in the eco cab could mean a few things. Um, uh, they could just be have been dispersing through the area um just making exploratory movements or possibly there was a breeding pair of wolverines there previously and perhaps a female had recently died um and so when audrey's two-year survey ended uh there were a lot of remaining questions on the status of wolverines in the eco cap um from 2012 the end of those surveys to 2018 um, Audrey and ODFW continued operating a couple of camera stations um, over the winter to keep track of Stormy. Um, and every year, except for one or two, uh, he'd been photographed, um, mostly during spring months. Uh, but there hadn't been any other wolverines detected um, in the whole state of Oregon ever since. Um, and so Audrey's surveys identified the need for um, a long-term wolverine monitoring plan in the Wallawas to understand what the population dynamics are in this um, somewhat isolated habitat block. And so do breeding, uh, breeding populations periodically occur there and then just blink out? Or um, will the Blue Mountain region, um, which the Wallawas are within, um, will they ever support breeding wolverines? And um, in the future, will they reduce that gap between the uh, of wolverine habitat between um, the Rockies and the Cascades? So um, 
with honors mentorship, we set out to conduct another thorough survey of the Wallawas. Um, but we were targeting new camera sites above 7,000 feet. Um, and so the area uh, most predictive of breeding females. Um, and since the camera detections of Stormy in recent years had only occurred from um, brief visits during the spring months, we hope to learn more about um, how he was using the Wallawas um, during the winter time. Oops. All right, so here kind of the scope of our uh, camera effort here with the pilot season last year. Um, yeah, you can see we, we really wanted to cast a wide net over the Wallawas since it had been, you know, almost eight years since there had been a, a big concerted effort with a whole bunch of cameras out there. And so, you know, it's possible that there could have been other wolverines traveling through or even residing in the Wallawas that, that weren't detected in those other years. So we really wanted to, to hopefully know for sure. Um, and so we were targeting high elevation habitat um, and just looking for kind of full coverage, even distribution uh, across that habitat and the Eagle Cap and the Wallawas. And actually you can see um, one station uh, further east towards Hell's Canyon there that was, it's kind of, it was kind of an exploratory idea. It's like, well, it could be a possible dispersal route uh, for Wolverines hopping over from Idaho. Um, and so we set an extra one there just to see if we'd catch anything. Uh, so we ended up with 14 run pole stations uh, that were deployed in the fall months in October and November. And then we checked the accessible sites during the winter and early spring months into January and even May. And uh, we took down our cameras this summer, mostly in July. Uh, here's some photos from uh, fall deployments. We got a, a ton of help from ODFW who packed us in on horseback with their stock program for for a handful of our sites, which was a huge help because you think about all the gear uh, it needs to go in here, bait and cameras and tools and materials to set up these run poles, particularly. Um, so it was great to have have help with the horses to carry that stuff instead of us for all of these, especially overnight trips. Um, and we set stations, you know, late in the fall because we're trying to race the snow. You know, we're hoping for colder temps to keep bugs off of our bait or keep them from rotting. And hopefully, bears are thinking about going away and hibernating for the winter and not, not gonna be messing with the stations. And so it's always kind of a race where we're seeing how late we can go and set them towards winter. Um, and then uh, and then the hard part is just letting them sit and do their job for a couple months uh, until, until midwinter when we're gonna wanna get, in, get back in there and, and try and check some of them. And some of the stations actually are, are by design are purely over winter, you know, about actually about half of them we set in the fall and they're either so remote or the, the routes are too dangerous, avalanche prone, that we set them once and then they're hopefully they do their thing all winter long and we'll get them in the summer. Um, but for the, the accessible ones that we did check, we started in January and uh, it, it requires snowmobiling and then snowshoe, snowshoeing or skiing, um, sometimes camping to reach our sites and we did kind of two stints we did a trip in mid-january um, and early february checked a handful of stations and then again uh, february into early march and checked the rest of them that we wanted to all once and then of course COVID hit in march and you know we were quarantining along with everybody else and uh and things kind of died down but we were able to once we felt it was it was safe to kind of move around again we were able to check a few more uh in may also, and so the the objectives for um, checking these winter cameras are just to retrieve photos, SD cards, change batteries, make sure cameras are working properly, um, and then re reapply the the uh, meat bait and scent lure, make the sites more attractive, and uh, also more opportunities to to be out there and survey for wolverine tracks. Here's some other photos from the winter checks here. A couple overnight trips. Um, yeah, man, Wallawas are a gorgeous place to be in the winter. Um, just really fun to get out there and, and find some solitude and really rewarding, even though it can be, you know, deep snow, hard work um, some of the time. But it pays off when you find what you're looking for. And almost uh, as soon as we started checking cameras, I think it was the second one that we checked in January, we had Wolverine photos. Yeah, so we detected 
um, Wolverine at seven of 14 stations. The first detection was uh, on Christmas Eve, actually. And so, um, but all of these Wolverines were conclusively identified as Stormy. Um, so we did not find any new Wolverines, unfortunately. Um, but we detected Stormy a lot of times. There were 30 separate days that we got him on camera um, and at least one detection during each month in our um, 10 month uh, camera operating uh, period. And so, um, do we have a video for? Yeah, yeah, we do. Well, yeah. another interesting thing, if you look real closely at some of these photos, you can tell that Stormy's missing some claws on his right foot. He was caught in a leg hold trap accidentally in 2012, and uh, the state um, came out and, and released him, And uh, but he ended up kind of losing some, some end of some of his toes so on his right foot. That's another just easily distinguishable market of Stormy if he shows up on the camera here. And so, yeah, we got a video. Uh, kind of a compilation here. Yeah, so here is Stormy at one of our stations in the spring or early spring. You can tell he's pretty familiar with run poles. <laughs> he's definitely looking uh, his age, I think, and kind of working gingerly on these. I mean, we've seen other Wolverines in the in Washington Cascades be much more acrobatic on these, so we kind of we feel bad for hanging our bait so high and making them work so hard. Yeah, so, so Stormy, he was detected first as an adult male, and so that means, um, like, a mature male is around two years old, um, and so that means he will be uh, 12 in um, this winter season. At least. At, le at least 12. We don't, he could be older, because um, we don't know how long he was in the Eagle Cap or um, before he was detected. And so with this video, we had um, we had buried an elk head about four feet uh, under the snow um, to see if he would start digging it out, but um, he didn't. <laughs> he was a little too yeah, lazy. You couldn't tell it was down there or he wasn't hungry enough. But that spot that he was scratching was right where the elk head was buried. Yeah, so here's just the detection history that um, we have. And then this is a polygon showing um, the minimum area that we detected Stormy in. So that's like um, within this little triangle polygon um, is the minimum area that is of what might be his um, home range and territory. And so um, between October and July. Um, and so this only um, comprises of 80 square miles. And so when you think that a male typically has a home range of like 300 to 500 square miles. Um, we don't think that we have um, a grasp on his complete home range. It's probably larger than that, than that. but um, he may not have been detected at certain camera stations because he just didn't find them. And so we're rerunning them again this year and um, maybe he'll come across them and we'll get a little bigger of a picture of what his range is um, in the Eagle Cap. And, or maybe he's uh, even using area to the, um, the east of the Eagle Cap um, and maybe his range extends into where he's traveling through more marginal habitat or maybe even across the Snake River into the Seven Devils Mountain in Idaho, which would be extremely interested, interesting. So um, we'd like to investigate that. And we also detected a whole slew of other species, um, including but not limited to a specific martin here, Rocky Mountain red fox, uh, bobcat, cougar, and gray wolf, all at one station. It was that lower elevation station uh, towards Hell's Canyon there. And then a ton of black bears, it's a black bear families even, 
uh, in the spring and summer months. A few coyotes, a long-tailed weasel, northern flying squirrels, western red squirrels, and uh, deer mice as well. Um, ungulates, there were deer and elk sometimes along the background of, the of uh, some of the cameras in the summertime. And then a whole bunch of bird species like Stellar's jays, Clark's nutcrackers, Canada jays as well. Uh, we got a couple of videos of other species here. I'll do this bear family, it's kind of cool. mountain red fox, a, a silver face fox, and coyote at that, that camera we buried an elk head at. Reevaluating um, the wolverine habitat in the Malawas, um, we conclude that it's uh, unlikely that there are other resident wolverines in the area. Um, while there's been wolverine presence here in the Malawa range for nearly a decade, uh, or at least a decade, um, uh, this presence doesn't have any impact without resident females. And so um, Stormy's at least 11 years old, uh, which is definitely considered a senior age for a wild wolverine. Um, and at this time, he represents the entire known wolverine population in the entire state of Oregon. Um, and so we're going to continue monitoring him to collect as much information as we can um, on the understudied reproductive strategy that he represents, which is the establishment of lone males in territories without females. Um, and also a big takeaway um, from our pilot year of surveys is that we have a much more comprehensive updated information on Stormy's presence um, and his space use in, in the will allow us to um, provide to our Forest Service partners. Yeah. yeah, so as we enter our second round of monitoring this year, um, we're already underway. We, we finished our fall deployments, actually. We did them all in the month of October this year. Uh, we ended up with 11 run poles. We may set some more um, if we have resources or just run with these ones. And yeah, once again, ODFW packed us in, which was huge. We did several uh, multi-day trips and were able to knock out um, our most remote sites that way. It was a huge help. And so we're going to plan to revisit uh, six or seven of these. Uh, throughout the winter at least once and hopefully more if we have resources um, and then take down our stations in the summer again in July. Uh, another cool thing we're, we're hoping to do this year is utilize cell equipped trail cameras uh, to look for snow tracking opportunities see if we can follow wolverine tracks out there which usually is a needle in a haystack you're gonna go out in the mountain range and look for wolverine tracks uh, but it's, we got this secret weapon. These things are really cool. We've been gifted a few of them. We have two of them running right now. And you can see this photo on the right uh, was from today, actually. So, so they, when they have cell service, they'll send you a message through this app, and you can view the images pretty much in real time um, when you get them. So here we are 
November 18th today, there was a Pine Martin at one of these cameras. So no Wolverines yet, um, but that'll be a neat thing to try and see if when we get Wolverines visiting, um, maybe we can wait a day or two so as not to disturb them. And then if, if conditions, tracking and snow conditions allow, um, we can get out and follow or backtrack them, try and collect scat samples, uh, urine samples, and then take GPS routes of their wanderings and just try and learn more about Wolverine movement uh, throughout the Wallace. And actually the most exciting finding of the fall here, it came on our last day of setting cameras, it was on Halloween. Uh, we had some friends out helping and uh, we cut semi-fresh Wolverine tracks, great looking Wolverine tracks. So uh, really exciting to know that there's somebody still out there and roaming the Wallace right now as we speak even. Um, and it it could be another Wolverine, but we're kind of leaning, to, leaning towards Stormy. It's hard to tell from these tracks and the condition, but some of those that should have been a right front paw kind of look like they're missing some claws or toes or kind of hard to make out. So it's likely that it is Stormy, just given that he's he's been the only one around seemingly for a long time. But we're hopeful. Who knows? Could be could be somebody else as well. Yeah, so while we're out there um, in remote carnivore, carnivore habitat throughout the winter, um, it only makes sense that we um, look around for other carnivore species as well. So this year, we're adjusting our survey design to um, incorporate some uh, other, to collect data on other carnivores of interest, um, like the Rocky Mountain Red Fox and Pacific Martin, um, in collaboration with some new and existing uh, projects. And so we're gonna be collecting fox scats and genetic, info, inf, um, genetic samples from Martin um, and adding, um, so our run pull cameras are high up on trees now, they have to stay above the snow. Um, and so we're adding ground cameras to collect more information about um, the other carnivores that are sharing winter landscapes with wolverines. And so um, that helps us learn more about the potential relationships between wolverines and other carnivores in the Laos um, as well. Yeah, and we're also hoping to maximize the, the impact of, of this project effort and uh, do more outreach, like talks like this, we'll, we'll give another one for Oregon Wildlife Foundation um, coming up, and then hopefully some educational opportunities. We're already working with uh, Greater Oregon STEM Hub, has a bunch of counties in Eastern Oregon, and we, we have, uh, we're gonna make a, a short video for their Explore Science Club um, that'll go out to third and sixth graders in the region, and it's a career-connected learning curriculum, so it gives students an idea of what kind of careers are out there um, in the STEM world. And also another neat one is it's the website's called Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, and it's presentations that are live streamed to multiple classrooms uh, around the country from scientists, explorers, researchers uh, all over the world. So we're going to give um, hopefully a few Wolverine presentations to uh, to classrooms and students uh, through those guys. Yeah. So. Um... Also, we were lucky to have TLP Media um, accompany us to a couple of our monitoring sites during the pilot season, um, and they are putting together a 20-minute film focused on Stormy in our uh, fieldwork last winter. Um, so it's going to be free on YouTube and Vimeo, and um, they uh, provide they um, provided some nice video cameras for us, which got the great Stormy footage that was played earlier. Um, and some of the more professional looking backdrops to a few of the slides were just some screen grabs from that uh, that video. So um, you can see a teaser for the video on the Vimeo link um, on there. Um, and Or you can go to their website and subscribe to an email alert for uh, if you're interested in watching it once it's released. Yeah, so some of you might be wondering, you know, how can I advocate for wolverines or wolverine recovery? Um, easy, simple stuff. Just learn more about wolverines. Um, you know, maybe do some research on your own, read up about the species, um, wolverine habitat and the issues they face. Um, and really, the more you know, the more you fall in love with wolverines. They're just, they're just so fascinating um, and awesome animals. And then look for ways to support Wolverine research efforts. Uh, if you if you live anywhere near a Wolverine population uh, or any place Wolverines could be, 
odds are there's a research project uh, going on to study them. So seek those out, learn about them, and get in, get in touch and see what ways you contribute or you can contribute um, either through donations, contributions, or uh, even volunteering for some of those research uh, studies. There, there could be plenty of opportunities. You don't have to be a, a backcountry skier or a snowmobiler or, or even a hiker. You know, there's plenty of other ways to help uh, research projects, offering any unique skills you have, or uh, volunteering to, to undertake the tedious task of sorting through hundreds or thousands of photo detections is just a huge uh, data set that researchers are working with, and it's always great to have help doing that kind of stuff. Um, and then lastly, just voting for politicians, representatives that support science uh, and the environment and climate action. Um, it, policies really matter, both at the federal and the state level. Uh, and they really do have an impact on the long-term survivability for, for species like wolverines. Um, so keep that in mind when you go and vote. And lastly, if you guys feel the need to, you can donate to the wildlife, uh, the, sorry, the Oregon Wildlife Foundation, um, which runs our project and uh, just a whole bunch of other great projects. And they give grants to other research and conservation projects going around or going on around the state. Um, and their mission is to empower the lasting conservation of fish and wildlife and citizen enjoyment of our natural resources. And so two ways to do that. And regardless, just go and check out their website. There's a bunch of good information on there. And uh, they set up an easier way. You can text Wolverine to 91999 and they'll, uh, you'll get a link to their donation page and, uh, and they'll take you there. All right, well, yeah, thank you for um, listening and we'll take some questions now. Hopefully we didn't go too much over time. <laughs> no, no, you did great. Thank you again so much. That was wonderful. I uh, particularly, it wasn't the Wolverine video, but I really liked the coyote, like, wait, I know I smell an elk head, but like, what, <laughs> where is it? This is really funny. Um, yeah, we have a lot of great questions, so let's get right to it. Um, awesome. Somebody asked, they said they just couldn't tell by the map, was Stormy detected in Hell's Canyon or any, I guess, or any other Wolverine? He was not. Um, and so I kind of made the map a little vague just because it's like, that's his home range and he's currently there. Um, and so didn't want to give too much away. Um, but no, we only detected Stormy um, within the Eco Cap Wilderness and adjacent, uh, adjacent areas on the National Forest. Um, uh, but not in Hell's Canyon. But we are really interested in putting cameras in more dispersal area over by Hell's Canyon um, to understand, like, um, if the if they're like to see if any other wolverines are dispersing over from the um, populations in the Payette that might just be getting bumped out by Stormy because he's a territorial male and doesn't want any other males hanging around his area. Yeah, the Seven Devil Mountains are, it's a small strip, but it is Wolverine habitat right on the other side of the, of the Snake River there. And so very possible it could be Wolverines there or, or going even back and forth, so. Yeah. Um, somebody wanted to know, what is the range of female Wolverines? Um, so it's, it's smaller than males. And so typically like a male home range will encompass the ranges uh, or the territories of, um, a few females and so females will be like 100 to 300 square miles while males will be um, like 300 to 500 square miles and that varies a lot um, depending on the habitat and um, and so there's like where wolverine there's like differences in um, wolverine densities but in different habitat types um, but there is like a sexual dimorphism with um, female and male wolverines like the females are um, a lot smaller than than the males. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, sorry, looking through the questions, we have some of the same variety. So I'm going to try to blend it all together. One person asked, "Is trapping restricted in Wolverine territory?" Another person asked, "Why hasn't um, mm -hmm. trapping been closed in Stormy's range?" So obviously, kind of same variety, but basically. Mm -hmm. Not seeing, I mean, we all know the sort of indirect impacts of catching, um, sort of bycatch, if you will, of trapping. And so to know that Stormy actually did get caught in a trap yeah. definitely speaks to how that could happen again or other wolverines. So I don't know mm -hmm. if you can just speak broadly to trapping in Oregon or specifically in his territory and just what, yeah, is there something to be done with that? 
Yeah, great question. Um, so in the in the Eagle Cap wilderness, there is a road that goes kind of straight into the heart of the wilderness. And so that's bad when you think about trapping and like wolverine habitat. You can trap there. There's not a lot of people who do trap there, um, but there is bobcat trapping there. Um, and um, when Stormy was trapped, um, the trapper recognized that it was a very sensitive species and quite a surprise that he'd gotten a wolverine in his trap. And so he um, like right away called the um, ODFW and they were able to release him. But that's a concern for um, for um, the future. And if if wolverines do recover in this area, it's, it's going to be a persistent problem. And so um, there are alternatives that you could have instead of closing down trapping, you can just change the type of trap um, that that people use. And so it might cause just like, alt like an, an option would be to create like diff alternatives to um, traps that involve some um, like damage to um, or like undue harm to wolverines. Yeah, or making some sort of cubby box trap, wooden trap that wolverines can chew out of. They 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 can chew out of huge log live traps that folks use, you know, if they're in there long enough. So there are ways to do it. I know the state did a bunch of outreach and, and education um, once, you know, there were wolverines documented via Audrey's study to trappers in the area, and I think throughout the state, um, and giving information about wolverines. Um, but even so, those the trapping uh, regulations, you know, they're very strict. Folks have to check them you know, at least once a day type of thing. Um, and so you know, hopefully ways to mitigate that sort of that sort of deal. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I guess I'm also curious. So there's not even a restriction on wolverine trapping necessarily. It's not even just people setting traps for other things. It's not even like wolverine trapping is illegal. Oh yes, wolverine trapping yeah. is illegal um, okay. throughout the, um, the lower 48. And so um, there was, uh, the, there, there's a trapping season for wolverines in Montana that is on hold right now, um, and so that hasn't occurred for um, I don't know how many years, yeah. but um, there's currently no trapping, no trapping for wolverines. In, gotcha. Um, okay. Yeah. Just wanted to clarify that because I realized even in asking my question, I'm like, wait a minute, there's also there's just yeah. traps yeah. for other species that wolverine get caught in, but then there's it, was there actually even restrictions on wolverine trapping? Um, let's see. Going through. Do wolverine have a positive impact on the ecosystem? Are they a keystone predator in any way? Yeah, so this is, <laughs> I was wondering if we'd get this question. So um, <laughs> wolverines are never in high enough abundance to cause, to, to um, cause like ecosystem services, I don't think. Well, I don't, I don't wanna say like never in high enough abundance because there's like places where they could be like an apex predator because all of the other like larger predators like wolves have been removed. Um, so um, as scavengers, they, um, scavengers have a lot of benefits to the ecosystem as a whole, um, like um, getting rid of carcasses on the landscape um, and um, which like contains disease. Um, and so, um, yeah, the, the, the loss of wolverine, the wolverines don't have like a cascading effect on um, other species in the ecosystem per se, but um, it's more of a, I guess, a cultural, like. <laughs> yeah, the, the wildness factor. I mean, it's, yeah. it's very exciting. I mean, half the people you talk to about projects like this say, oh, I didn't even know there were wolverines in Oregon. And so it's exciting for people to know. It makes it feel a little more wild if you're out there, you know, that you, maybe you can see one or just to know that they're around or they could be around. Um, it's, yeah, it's really fun. Yeah, there's a huge value to having um, your whole, your complex of um, carnivores on the landscape. Um. Amen. <laughs> we agree. Um, are there plans to reintroduce wolverine or a pair of wolverines to the area, to the Wawas or anywhere else in Oregon that you know of? Um, so this is the topic that comes up periodically, it seems like, um, in regards to Oregon and other places where single wolverines have been found, like in California, where there was a lone male for 10 years um, in the Tahoe area, or Colorado, where a male was there for five years and then moved on and was shot in North Dakota. And so it's, a, it's, um, it's uh, the conversation about um, reintroducing wolverines into Oregon has been had, but it hasn't been, um, it hasn't like gotten much of a foothold. Um, 
since the wolverine was um, petitioned for listing as an, a threatened species with ESA protections, there's a little hesitancy to um, put an animal on um, like create a breeding population in Northeast Oregon, which might cause um, like some changes in restrictions in certain areas. So I guess that's where the hesit hesitancy is for reintroducing wolverines, um, but um, yeah, and also just the, the the factor that you know they they can come back on their own as these guys obviously did. There were there were all of a sudden there were three wolverines ten years ago. You know where they come from. So and that that breeding population of the payette is is so close in wolverine terms that you know it's within their own possibility that they may reestablish a population on their own. So it's yeah, and so yeah, justify it. Yeah, and so the Wallows are there. Are, it's a small habitat block, and so and it is um, isolated um surrounded by um less suitable habitat so it's isolated and so why haven't wolverines returned um and made breeding populations and so um questions like that need to be investigated before um before reintroduction happen and investigations as to why why are animals from the payette not coming over more frequently like look into um the breeding population there and the status of that um population um and maybe the food habits are there enough prey resources to sustain yeah, some... denning females in the Wallawas through mm -hmm. the summer months and stuff like that. Um, folks want to know just more about breeding in general. How many pups, if they're all if they are called pups, <laughs> if that's the right word. Um, yeah, just generally the breeding season, like yeah, what are we looking at in way of breeding and what's survival and all of that? Yeah. yeah. Um, so wolverines, they, um, they mate in the summertime, and so then they, um, the females have a delayed implantation where um, it's a fertilized egg, but it's just kind of in limbo for a while until um, it implants, and then um, the, um, the, they, the, it develops, and then kids are born in, um, like, the the average birthday for scientific as the scientific average Not birthday sure. for um wolverines is uh valentine's day and so um they're born in february or march um and so um they'll nurse um for uh a period and um then they don't leave their dens the den the natal den where they're born until later until about may so they're in the den the kids the uh, kids are in the den from like February to May. And so once that, um, once they're a little more, um, old, once they're a little older and they can start moving around and following the mom around, um, they'll, the mom will start um, taking the kids and um, stashing them at different spots in different protected places. And those would be like called maternal dens. And so, um, so as, they, as they get older, they're able to follow her around more and, um, and so the earliest time um, wolverines will uh, disperse or disperse and become independent of their mother is around the fall, so like November-ish. Um, and so, but there has been, um, <clears throat> there's uh, like sub-adult wolverines could stay in their parents' uh, territories for, um, until they're mature. And so that's, there's a lot of interesting research about um, that's more recent about um, sub-adult wolverines, like the parents tolerating the young wolverines in their territory for longer than um, previously assumed. So, um, and like the kids following the dads around. Um, so there's a lot of um, kind of endearing family dynamics that happen with, um, with wolverines that um, are starting to become understood better. Yeah, there's a lot still to learn. Wonder when they ask them to start paying rent. How old they are? <laughs> You've been here too long. Ground squirrels. <laughs> yeah. What are you bringing us? Um, okay. I think we have time for one more question. I just want to be mindful of people's time because we tend to keep these to about an hour. Um, I think he kind of answered that one. Let's see. Ooh, is there a certain time of year that wolverines make their long-distance exploratory movements or dispersal? Mm -hmm. Is there a particular time that they? do that long distance travel to new territory um yeah so 
I believe it's in the springtime um, or just over the winter. And so um, it might, I mean, it would, it would occur like throughout if a wolverine, just like a young male wolverine disperses in November, um, the year it's born, um, it'll continue making those exploratory movements. I'm not, I'm not as familiar with like the work on um, like uh, dispersal ecology of wolverines. And I just don't think that is something that's, um, that there's a lot of information on um, because a big question mark is um, like these big dispersal movements. And so that like, there's been a lot of neat research projects that um, follow uh, um, dispersing animals with GPS collars. Um, but there, there's, I don't believe there's like a, um, a big data set on um, timing and, um, and I guess exploratory movements or if those have like a lull during a certain season and then they pick up again if, some, if an animal is making like a very long-term um, dispersal. Thank you. Um, and I had somebody, a uh, colleague of ours, uh, just give us a fact check that ODFW requires traps to be checked for fur bearers um, every 48 hours. So uh, there is definitely room for improvement on Oregon's trap check regulation. So I do think that's also, you know, even if they're not to outright restrict trapping in Wolverine territory, there's probably some improvements we can make on how often they're required. And like you said, which traps yeah. are allowed um, that are, yeah accidentally getting Wolverine, even if it's not the main target. So, um, well, thank you so much for your time, you two, and for your work. It was really wonderful to hear about Stormy and hopefully more that are out there we just don't really know about yet. But um, yeah, we appreciate it and uh, good luck this year. <laughs> yeah, oh, thank so you. Much. Thank yeah. you so much for having us. And thank this you everybody for listening in. Yeah. Yep. And again, this was this is recorded, so it'll be available on our website tomorrow. And uh, yeah, have a great evening, evening, everyone. And thanks, Kayla and Scott. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Good job.